presentation on SkedFreak, so integrating the scheduler with CPU Freak. Uh, I think this has been, this material, some of it's made uh, its way into past connects, but uh, of course we've made some progress. So uh, I thought I would review, just kind of give people a little bit of a, re of a refresher on the motivation behind the project. Um, we'll go over some of the design elements that we've been working on in the last six months or so. Uh, we have some test results, uh, latest test results that have been gathered just within the last couple weeks. Um, there was a little bit of upstream activity recently that caught us off guard. Uh, that's a fun story. And then uh, it's the next steps that we have planned for uh, the months to come. So uh, just to clarify, we do have a hacking session to talk more in detail. Um, if you have uh, sort of deeper questions or proposals, those are probably better left until tomorrow. Uh, I've got the information here on when and where that is. Uh, so you know, quick questions and clarifications, obviously, we can handle those today. So as I say, just to go through, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but just motivation behind uh, this project, uh, how things kind of don't work today, the sort of problems that we're trying to solve. Um, so what do we currently have? How does CPU Freak work today? Uh, you probably are all sort of semi-familiar with it at least. Uh, it's a plug-in architecture uh, where you have these governors that uh, implement different kinds of policy. Uh, the most popular ones today, which are probably on-demand and interactive, are sampling-based. Uh, so I've got some examples here uh, illustrating different scenarios where that's a problem and it, it doesn't uh, give you the optimal response. So for the purpose of these examples, you can assume these platform details here, uh, say an fmin of 100 me uh, megahertz, fmax of gigahertz, and a policy that, uh, this policy that I've described here is kind of similar to what on demand does. So this is the sort of timeline that we'll, I'll use for all of these examples of which I think I've got uh, maybe five or six. Uh, so if you take, uh, say, a task uh, execution profile of what you have here, so you can see that these are, I've divided the timeline into 20 millisecond intervals. So that's a common uh, period, a sampling period used with on-demand or interactive. And then, you know, at the end of every 20 millisecond sampling interval, we will say, you know, update the frequency based on the amount of busy time or non-idle time that, we've, that we saw in the prior uh, 20 millisecond window. So in this particular uh, execution graph, uh, towards the end, you can see that we have a couple of uh, windows that are mostly or entirely busy, and then a couple that are mostly idle. So this, uh, you know, in this particular example, this is an issue because uh, that second to last window where we have full task execution, that's going to end up being run at uh, fmin because we were completely idle or almost completely idle in the, pr in the prior window. So you're going to be underserving the task demand in that second to last window. And then at the end of that window, we're going to go to fmax on demand or interactive is going to respond and freak out and, and go to, you know, to react to the load. But of course, you know, it just so happens that the task was done and we spend another 20 milliseconds running uh, much faster than we needed to. So that's bad. New tasks is another example of something where we can underserve the demand. So this is an issue uh, in particular for things like benchmarks, where you want to squeeze out you know, every possible amount of performance that you can. So we have a task that started kind of in the middle of a window. So in that second window there, uh, we'll be running presumably at fmin, because the preceding window was mostly or entirely idle. And then not only that, but actually in the third window there, we're still not going to be running as fast as we'd like to because there was some idle time in that second window. You know, I mean, the, the demand didn't line up, obviously. It, it, it's often not going to line up perfectly with your windows. So both of those windows are going to be run at uh, suboptimal uh, performance level. Likewise, an exiting task. Um, in, uh, so here, that second to last window is going to be run at, at a high performance level, even though the task is gone. And we have the information to know about that, right? I mean, the scheduler can see that this task exited. It knows the performance characteristics of that task uh, via methods that I'll uh, describe later. Uh, so there's really no reason why we shouldn't be able to lower the frequency uh, you know, more quickly. And then task mi migration also poses a couple of issues uh, in, in different scenarios. So here, um, similarly, you can probably guess what's going to happen. I mean, that, that third to last window immediately after the migration on the top CPU is going to be run faster than it needed to be because it was, uh, you know, it saw high demand in the preceding window. And likewise, right after the task migrates, it's going to be underserved because there was no demand on that CPU in the preceding window. 
And lastly, um, migrations back and forth uh, during a window. So you can split the demand um, between two different CPUs in the same window. And even though, say, the task may, might have a 100% demand, maybe it's a CPU bound task, um, but as a result, you never see all that demand on one CPU in a window. So nothing ever gets run, say, at Fmax as fast as you'd like it to be uh, executed. So as a result, you know, neither of the CP, uh, CPUs offers the performance level that you would want. And then just kind of as a sort of a side benefit to the work that we're trying to do, I, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I can say this is really the primary objective, but it's a common complaint that tuning this stuff is way too complicated, right? And the, the maintainers are, uh, in particular, uh, very eager to reduce the number of knobs and make this more sort of an out-of-the-box friendly uh, solution. And I think the OEMs would uh, enjoy that as well. So, you know, the, just the number of knobs even in the upstream uh, governors, well, interactive is not upstream, but something that's commonly used. I mean, they're already uh, pretty high. It's very difficult to know going into it how to approach uh, tuning with all, with all these knobs. And then to make matters worse, if you look at uh, a code base, say, from like Samsung or other vendors, they tend to, especially the, the larger vendors that have the bandwidth to do this, they add, uh, you know, more layers of hacks on top of even what's upstream. So as a response to all this, um, the famous line in the sand email, so Ingo Molnar, one of the scheduler maintainers, weighed in uh, you know, several years back and said, you know, I'm done with this thing where we have all these separate subsystems that don't cooperate with each other. We have all these uh, you know, subsystems that could be communicating and sharing information. Like I mentioned, when a task exits, there's no reason that the scheduler and CPU freak should not be working together to do something more intelligent. So he has you know, basically said, no more of these you know, disparate, uh, you know, isolated isolated power saving techniques. We want something that's integrated uh, to, to bring all these subsystems together and do something more intelligent. So okay, so Skedfreak, that's the, that's the sort of refresher course. Um, so what are we working on uh, in the Skedfreak design? So Skedfreak is a CPU governor, um, which doesn't sound that uh, radical by itself. Okay, great, you know, another governor. Um, I think the long term goal is that hopefully we can get rid of CPU freak altogether. Um, you know, that, I think that's probably pretty far down the road. I mean, the, the initial uh, goal, the, the, the short-term goal, is just to get something that can leverage the knowledge in the scheduler. Um, and, and this is sort of a very simplified view of, of how that works. So Skedfreak, a governor, takes input from the different scheduling classes in the scheduler. Um, what we aggregate the capacity requests from each scheduling class and pass that on to the CPU Freak framework, which passes it on to the driver. So, you know, I think eventually, um, and actually, I mean, Raphael uh, is already sort of um, moving things towards the direction of the Sked Freak talking directly to the driver, uh, and I'll speak to that more a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but this is sort of the high-level view. So I'm going to go and sort of just talk specifically about each one of the scheduling classes and how we estimate uh, capacity. So CFS, um, I think everybody's probably um, familiar with the perennity load tracking algorithm. Um, it was introduced in, in the 3.8 kernel by someone from Google. Uh, it's an exponential moving average, so this is the, sort of the equation for that. Um, for our solution, you do need um, both frequency invariance and microarch invariance. So, so what does that mean? Um, today, with Pelt out of the box, or not today, but say a year ago, um, the, the capacity estimate that you would get for a task or for a run queue, uh, it did not take into account the fact that the CPU could be running at different frequencies, right? And that's pretty important. Um, so uh, that's, you know, support to, to recognize that fact has since been added. Uh, most of it is, is upstream. Um, there's some ARM-specific stuff that's not yet upstream. Uh, likewise, the same thing applies to microarch invariants and big little. Uh, you need that capacity estimate to take into account the fact that if you have something running on, say, an A7, um, you know, the A7's IPC is, is lower than, that, say, an A15. And that should be factored into uh, the capacity numbers, say, because if I want to look at maybe migrating a task from an A7 to an A15, I need to understand that a task running on an A7 is going to take more time than a task running on an A15, even if they're running at the same frequency. Uh, so likewise, similar to frequency invariance, some of that code has gone upstream. There's some ARM stuff that still needs to go upstream, uh, but that stuff is written. So one of the issues that we have with perennial load, load tracking, and we've known this for a while, um, and this is kind of a consequence of its um, 
heritage from a server environment is that it's fairly slow to react. So I've just thrown this uh, slide in here to kind of give you a depiction of that. Um, this is the load tracking of a task as it runs um, from zero to 400 milliseconds uh, and zero to 100%. Uh, and, and you can see that it takes, uh, you know, it's about 200 milliseconds really to reach the full 100%. I mean, after about I don't know, 150 milliseconds or so, maybe you can say it's, it's sort of close, it's above 90%, uh, it looks like there. But I mean, th these are numbers that are vastly beyond the scale of what's acceptable for, say, an Android device, right? I mean, if you're looking at something, if you're, if you're flinging, uh, you know, Facebook or, or the Verge website or something on your phone, uh, the CPU frequency response needs to be, you know, I mean, we're talking about frames uh, for like a, a 60 hertz display cycle or something. Uh, we're talking timelines on the order of like, you know, 16 milliseconds. So this, this is an issue. And I'll talk about some of the things that are being done to remedy that. Um, these are a couple other sort of just interesting issues with Pelt. Um, I ran in, in, into a bug actually with Pelt, um, I don't know, six months ago or so, where the initial task load was, was not being, uh, um, honored. So basically, uh, you know, one of the things that we can do, um, as I mentioned in one of the examples in the first segment, uh, when a new task is created, we should be able to benefit from that. And depending on how you tune it, so you can, you can configure this to say initial tasks, I want them to be uh, treated as 100%. So when you start a task, you don't know obviously what it's going to be. Uh, you know, you don't have any data on its behavior, right? So uh, that's a configurable, uh, tunable value. Uh, and, and because of a bug, that just was being ignored. So even when you set that to 100%, it, it wasn't being, uh, um, you know, recognized. And that's been fixed now. Fix has been pushed upstream. Um, another interesting point with CFS is that the blocked load is actually included. It stays in the util average. So even when tasks sleep, uh, that load is, is continued to be factored into the utilization that you're going to pass on to the governor and it gets decayed periodically. Uh, and this is another uh, sort of interesting, you know, this is very different from say the sampling based approach in on-demand or interactive, right? In on-demand, if you have some task activity and then the task sleeps, once that 20 millisecond window is, is done, none of the demand from that lives on, right? There's no tail of, of demand from that task that lives on until it wakes up again and, and executes some more. So this is a sort of a fundamental difference in the way load is treated. Uh, with the scheduler-based stuff as opposed to the sampling-based governors. So moving on to the deadline uh, class. So I don't know how many people are familiar with the deadline scheduling class. It's fairly new. Um, deadline tasks are, are unique in that when you register a deadline task with the system, uh, you have to pass several parameters which describe the amount of runtime that the task is going to consume. So uh, deadline assumes that your workload is periodic in nature. So you have to specify the periodicity of the task. And then within that period, you have to specify the maximum runtime that the task will take. And then also the deadline for that work. You know, at, what, at what point in that, in that period must the work be complete? And so that's the full description of the task's bandwidth reservation. And then the scheduler will look to make sure that it can admit that task by looking at all of the deadline tasks that it's already uh, admitted to the system. So you know, using the runtime and the period, we can, come up, we can very easily come up with a worst case uh, you know, description of the amount of bandwidth that the deadline task is going to consume. And so then we could, you know, use that, pass that on to Schedutil, or, uh, sorry, uh, Schedfreak. Schedutil comes later, I'll get, I'll get to that. Uh, we can pass it on to the Schedfreak solution. It can aggregate that with our CFS request and use that to set the frequency. So there's a couple of issues, though, with that very simple way of doing things. Um, one is that it's, it, as I say, it's worst case, right? So when you're specifying a deadline workload, um, you know, you want to come up with the worst case time, but it could be that most of the time the workload doesn't do that. But you set the frequency of the system. You now have a, you know, a capacity request in that just always assumes that, and you're wasting power uh, by doing that. Um, the other thing is, is that the way that this would work is that that, that capacity request would always be present. So even when the task is sleeping, you're still running at the frequency as though that task needs to execute and complete. So again, a, a power waste of power. So there's another possibility for um, a better solution, which uh, say is related to bandwidth reclaiming. Um, I'm not the expert on deadline. You can direct your questions to Yuri about that, Yuri Lowy. Um, but uh, both of these uh, solutions are kind of under uh, analysis and discussion. 
so lastly, out of the three SCED classes, we have the, the real-time class. Um, this one is tough because we don't have any real good effective mechanism for it. Um, you have task priority, but that's it. You don't have the nice, uh, neat, uh, you know, constraints or parameters that come with deadline. Uh, there's no uh, advanced, uh, you know, system like PELT. Uh, all we have is a fairly basic mechanism called the RT average, which already exists. And uh, in the scheduler, it's a way, it's been a way for the scheduler to understand how much of a CPU is going to be consumed by RT bandwidth, uh, and then how much is left over for CFS. Um, there's no way to react to, to sort of short-term latency constraints. It's, it's really meant as a long-term uh, kind of um, metric. So it's not optimal, but it's already there, so we can use that uh, for now, and uh, you know, maybe something better will, will come to pass. Um, you know, one thing about RT is that actually the scheduler, well, at least Peter Zilstra, one of the other scheduler maintainer, has been pushing for a policy of just when you have an RT task that needs to run, set the frequency to Fmax. And that, that's a very aggressive policy that uh, I think many of us don't think will be realistic for especially uh, mobile platforms. Uh, I mean, it would be, uh, you know, terrible for power. Um, not to mention the fact that a lot of mobile platform, or uh, RT workloads, they simply don't need that kind of bandwidth. Uh, if you look at like an Android system running a low power workload, it's, it's very frequently going to run RT tasks, but they, you know, they, they run for a very small amount of time. I mean, it's very, uh, very little work. So it would be a waste. There's also the issue that uh, setting the frequency on ARM platforms can be a rather expensive uh, event. So, you know, changing the frequency constantly like that, uh, a lot of times you're going to be done with your RT work before you complete the frequency change, so, uh, completely uh, negating the point. So. Okay, so now that we have capacity estimates for all three of the SCED classes, how do we aggregate them? Um, just a simple sum. There's not anything really fancy here. Um, we do add headroom to the CFS and RT uh, estimates. So deadline, you don't need a headroom because, you know, the way that deadline tasks are specified, you already have a maximum and upper bound on the capacity that those tasks are going to require. But CFS and RT, that's not the case. So CFS and RT, the estimates that we have are really just, you know, um, best effort estimates at the actual capacity requirement, and if those get overshot, we need to provide some headroom there for them to grow into. Um, you also have to add headroom, headroom because if you do not, uh, I won't get really too deep into this, but you can get stuck. Um, you, you, know, you, you need a way to understand that the demand of your tasks have grown, and if you constantly request exactly 100% of what your task is, is, is requiring, there's no way for you to ever raise the frequency above that because you, know, you can only give the task the bandwidth that your CPU has at that time, right? So once it's saturated the 100%, you, know, you wouldn't be able to grow any further. And then we, so once we have a, a capacity requirement, we can scale that to a frequency using the policy max value. Um, and a quick note on this, um, there's actually an interesting sort of race condition there uh, with thermal and throttling. So in the governor, when we need to do this translation, it could be that, you know, maybe thermal has just uh, reduced the policy max value. Um, as it turns out, that race isn't really worth solving because, uh, so, the, you know, the pelt numbers will have been accrued over sort of a long time. And even if that just, you know, even if the throttling just went into effect, the numbers that you have are still based on the old max value. So th there really isn't a good coherent way of, of solving that race at this time, uh, but it d doesn't seem like something that's going to be a, a major issue, so we haven't uh, attacked it yet really any further. So once we have all the uh, values uh, aggregated, the SCED class values aggregated for a particular CPU um, within a frequency domain, the various CPUs that you have within a frequency domain uh, is very simple, just the max, you know, the guy with the max request is going to drive your request in that frequency domain. So setting the frequency, um, this, you know, in, in hot scheduler pass, you obviously have to be really careful about this. Um, there's locking considerations as well as performance uh, implications, and different platforms are going to behave differently, obviously, depending on their, the way their uh, frequency drivers are written. Um, if the driver sleeps, that means you, you can't do this from the hot scheduler path, or even if it's just very slow. Um, so we can always calculate the target frequency in the hot, uh, in the hot, in the fast path. Um, but then, you know, these are the considerations that we have for whether you can actually go ahead and set the frequency. Um, obviously, as I say, if the driver slow or sleeps, then, then you can't do that. Um, it, SCEDFREAK has a throttling mechanism. Uh, it could be that you don't want to issue more than a certain number of frequency operations per second. 
So it could be that Sked Freak is currently throttled, in which case you obviously don't want to, to, to attempt the transition right away. It could be that your uh, frequency driver is asynchronous and that transition is not done yet, in which case you obviously can't issue another one. So that's another reason why you wouldn't be able to do it in the fast path. Um, and then it may also be that you had previously uh, kicked a request out to the slow path for one of the previous reasons, like uh, the asynchronous uh, transition not being done yet or, or being throttled, in which case maybe the slow path picked that up and, and then obviously you can't, uh, you can't issue a concurrent request. So the slow path would be a k-thread that we've made RT um, and yeah, you can kick stuff out to it, you can sleep, you can do whatever you want, it's safe to do a whole bunch of work. Uh, but this is bad, right, because I mean, it's ta waking up a task is a lot of overhead, especially, you know, doing that for the number of events that we're considering and the number of frequency transitions. Uh, you know, waking up a task uh, is very disruptive to the system, so we'd like to avoid that when possible. So the locking, um, this was a major concern for a while. I think, yeah, there was a lot of worry that um, this would be a major impediment to setting the frequency in the fast path. And it, it's not really uh, materialized, I think. You know, we, we took a look at it and the, the locking doesn't seem to be a major concern. Um, so the, in the places that we've put the scheduler hooks, uh, so the, the calls into SkedFreak from the scheduler, um, you hold the run queue lock. And so that gives you a natural protection over the per CPU data. So for every CPU, we, you know, we're maintaining uh, the capacity requests from the three scheduler classes. And this gives you a natural way to synchronize those, uh, the modifications to those things. Um, in terms of being able to set the frequency in the fast path, uh, you know, there was some worry about you know, whether we have to access the, read, the, the policy read write sum in CPU Freak. Uh, but there again, I mean, it turns out that the, the data structures that we access uh, you know, can, can be safely uh, inspected without looking at that. Uh, the min max I spoke to previously, um, you know, we do have a race condition with uh, translating capacity to frequency using the max value. But, but as I say, that race condition is not really a concern. So. So I'll just take, you know, this, this is kind of getting into the weeds maybe for this presentation, but I mean, the implementation that we have, um, we've defined several internal locks, um, a mutex for uh, static key control. So we, do, we have a static key which basically turns on and off whether these uh, hooks are going to be, uh, are going to take effect within the scheduler. There was, you know, there's a lot of concern about trying to be, um, not touch the scheduler paths when this thing is turned off so that the scheduler, you know, maintainers don't think that we're trashing their stuff and uh, give us some extra time, get the stuff in the tree and prove it out uh, before maybe we make it permanent. So uh, that single static key needs to be controlled. I mean, if you have multiple policies that are, you know, uh, controlled by this governor, uh, you know, the static key is going to be enabled uh, when one or more of those policies obviously is active. Uh, so you need a mutex to, to manage that. Um, the fast path, so anytime you could have multiple CPUs in a frequency domain, trying to reevaluate that frequency domain at the same time, right? Uh, and so you need a, a spin lock to, to protect against that uh, for concurrency. And then the slow path needs protection as well uh, to, to protect against, uh, you know, the fast and slow paths trying to walk over each other. So the scheduler hooks, um, these have been, these haven't changed a whole lot, I think, in the last uh, six months or so, but I thought I would just review them really quick. Um, Basically, when tasks uh, are in queued or dequeued, we, we update the frequency. Um, I have an asterisk next to dequeued because the behavior there is a little bit different, and I'll, I'll describe that more in a moment. Um, load balance, um, this is something that we need to work with upstream a little bit on, so um, Yuri and others took care to, when you do a load balance operation and you move multiple tasks, you don't want to update the, the, the capacity and the frequency after every task that you move, right? You'd rather wait until the load balance operation is done, you've moved everything, and then you go and you do a single update that takes care of all those things. Um, I mean, aside from being inefficient, you may also cause problems because, you know, if you can only set a certain, uh, if you can only issue a certain number of frequency transitions per second, and you go and you, had, you, know, you do one after the very first task, when you move the second task, uh, you know, you, you may not be able to update that for another 10 milliseconds or who, who knows how long, uh, not 10 milliseconds, but two, maybe three, four, I don't know, depending on your platform. So, uh, and that's something that upstream, uh, you know, Peter uh, and others, uh, I don't think that they, um, you know, we, we have some convincing we need to do. Um, they're, they're trying to push for a more simple uh, model of scheduler hooks, uh, really just, just one inside of, uh, of update, uh, 
Update capacity, update, update I forget that. Hmm? Update load average, that's right, yeah, thank you. Um, so we have another one in the tick, um, and this is where uh, our solution is also more aggressive, I think, than, than what's been discussed in upstream. Uh, so this gets back to the headroom that I described, uh, and if that is impacted, then we jump straight to FMAX. So it's not always just uh, a simple, uh, you know, based on the, the absolute requirement plus some headroom. We do have a, a provision to go all the way up to FMAX. Um, and then uh, we have some RT hooks as well. Uh, there are a few things that haven't been done yet. Uh, deadline uh, still needs to be actually instrumented. I mean, we have a plan, as I mentioned, the details earlier, but that's not actually coded up yet. And then there were some uh, migration paths in core.c that I've listed here that uh, have yet to be done. So just a quick uh, summary of the policy. Um, what is this going to get you, everything that I've just described? Um, so, you know, when tasks wake or block, uh, we'll reevaluate and set the frequency. Um, the blocking, the DQ event that I mentioned earlier that's somewhat special, um, when the task or when the CPU goes idle, we don't actually uh, set the new frequency. Because the, the thinking being that uh, you don't want to, you know, s you don't want to do more work just as a CPU is going idle. We'd rather just remove that CPU's capacity vote and then if another CPU in that frequency domain uh, ends up doing a reevaluation, it'll take care of the work of actually updating the cluster frequency. Uh, and then when ta and task migrations as well, we'll reevaluate re and set the frequency. Um, one concern with this approach is that, uh, you know, I mean, this is a lot of events, right? Um, is, is this too much? Is this too many? Um, I, I think uh, this is something that we really need to take a look at, um, the, con the power consequences of all these frequency transitions potentially. Uh, depending on uh, your workload. And then, yeah, I, I just spoke to this. This is just the uh, not setting the frequency when you're going idle. Um, so PELT is, is really important. I mean, obviously, that's, it, it's critical. Most of your tasks are going to be uh, fair tasks, um, and, and the, uh, the PELT algorithm is a central piece in, in the behavior that you're going to get out of this. Um, and so there's, there's already work going on to try and improve it. Um, Patrick Velasquez uh, at ARM has uh, um, some work to try and buffer the utilization um, to, to get a more stable estimate of the value. So if you look at sort of a, uh, a, a periodic workload, you get this sawtooth pattern out of PELT, which basically means that every time the workload wakes up after sleeping for a while, you've lost a lot of you know, the demand that you would built up in PELT. Uh, and, the, and the workload suffers for a while. So uh, he's working on a, a change to try and prevent that. Um, and then Vincent is, uh, is working on some invariance improvements. Um, you know, we've noticed that you can have the same amount of work done if, if, if you have a fixed period and you run the same amount of work at different frequencies, you will get a different utilization value out of that. After the work is done, if you look at the end of that period, the, the, the capacity request for that task will be different depending on the frequency that you ran. And it's not because some of that work didn't get done in the period. I mean, we're just, we're varying the frequency such that, you know, all the work is still done within that same period. It's just a consequence of the PELT algorithm, the way that it works. You get a different utilization value. And that's, that's not ideal, right? I mean, it should be the same regardless of whether, what the frequency is, assuming you did the same amount of work in the same amount of uh, overall time. So. And then Skedtune, which I won't get into. Um, I believe there's a presentation on that this week. Um, uh, yeah, a hacking session on Skedtune. So if you want to learn more about that, I mean, that's, that's a whole other project that's related to uh, how we're going to deal with getting rid of these tunables. Um, let me just uh, check the time here. So, okay. Doing pretty well. So, okay, so some latest test results. Um, these test results are pretty, uh, you know, th there are early numbers. Um, there's definitely some things that need to be looked into, <laughs> um, but let's have a look at them. So first, I'll spend a little bit of time just going over uh, the, the framework or the, the, the workload itself. So using RT app, I don't know how many people are familiar with RT app. It's a, it's a convenient framework for specifying um, a workload in, in a particular pattern. Uh, using a JSON file. So uh, we basically just have some scripts to run 16 different test cases of periodic workloads of varying uh, duty cycle and length. So you know, this is going to be a bit of an eye chart. I'm not sure if anybody can read this, but these are the 16 use cases. Um, so you can see that they range from anywhere from like 1% 1, 1 busy overall to about 43% busy. 
uh, and varying durations. Um, you know, you have a, um, uh, let's see, you know, like use case number two uh, runs busy for 10 milliseconds and then sleeps for one second. Um, there's also a 1% duty cycle uh, task that just runs for one millisecond and sleeps for 100 milliseconds. So you really get a good variety of behavior uh, that's going to test uh, the response of the system, uh, Pelt in particular. So as we run these, for every loop, we're just going to record the time that it took to execute the busy portion of each, uh, each loop and whether the busy work overran the period in that particular loop. And then for every entire test case, we're the average time to, to uh, complete the busy work. And then the total number of times we overshot the period. So when, when we have those numbers, we're going to define overhead as a metric, which is basically, uh, it's a percentage that shows how close we got to running either as fast as the, power, as the performance governor or as slow as the power save governor. So the, the platform that I'm using here mostly is the Chromebook 2 uh, Exynos 5800 based system. Um, this work is a fiend to CPU zero, which is an A15 um, that for me goes from 200 to 1800 meg uh, megahertz. Uh, it actually tops out at two gigahertz, uh, but the most recent clock support I have uh, limits it to 1800 for some reason. So these numbers actually look pretty good. Um, you can see that I'm comparing the Skedfreak governor against both on-demand and interactive uh, with default parameters. Um, on-demand and interactive are using 20 millisecond uh, windows. And there's just a couple of test cases where the overhead is noticeably higher. Um, the, the 10 millisecond run, uh, one second sleep case is, uh, is quite a bit worse. So that definitely needs to be investigated. Um, there's also one more case that's uh, a, bit, a bit worse, although not quite as bad. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm a little, uh, m more, more investigation needs to be done into these numbers because I'm still, uh, I'm a little, uh, they seem a little too good to be true. Maybe I'm just uh, pessimistic, <laughs> but uh, so we're going to be looking into that some more. Sorry? Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I, I look at, say, like the, the four millisecond run, 10 millisecond uh, idle case. Um, the numbers for all the governors actually show that they're running, they're giving you results that are quite close to the performance governor, right? Um, and I don't, I don't understand why that would be. I would expect it to be worse uh, because there's not enough demand there to justify us running so fast, you know? So I, I wonder if there's something else in the system that's, uh, but, but it's across the board. I mean, even with on-demand and interactive, I would expect the same thing. I don't know why they would run so fast. Um, I was asking uh, uh, about the rate limiting uh, knob for these results. So there's no rate limiting, yeah, for these results. It's just as fast as it can go. And, well, uh, do you know how much time, more or less, is required to actually do? To do a transition? Uh, no, I do not okay. on this platform. Yeah, I don't know. That's something yeah, I, should, yeah. I should determine. So the RT numbers do not look as good. Um, so this is uh, the RT average mechanism. Uh, there's a knob that controls uh, sort of the rate at which uh, the responsiveness of that knob. And uh, the default of it is actually 1,000 milliseconds. I d I've dialed it down to 50 uh, for this test. Um, but even with that, you can see that uh, it's, it's not responsive enough to really respond uh, to this. Uh, do you explain why the on-demand governor, let's say, fail almost all the why time? Why it's so bad, yeah. So that's something that showed up. Um, my, my results, uh, like say a few months ago, didn't have that. Uh, I think there's maybe something that's gone in upstream. It's, it's almost as though uh, the demand calculation that on-demand is doing is just not picking up the RT activity. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is something that showed up uh, when I rebased uh, a couple months ago or something. So. Uh, yeah, I'd like to get the time to, to look into that because, you know, but 
it's yeah, it wasn't my my priority. Uh, uh, so uh, we also did some profiling on the MediaTek 8173 evaluation board. Um, I want to thank uh, Freedom Tan for his uh, uh, all the time he put into helping me uh, get these numbers. Um, so this is another reason why I'm hesitant to declare success based on my Chromebook 2 uh, values. So the, the MediaTek board is not nearly as happy uh, with the SCEDGov. You can see that there's uh, widespread regre uh, regression uh, basically on any workload that has less than uh, 100 milliseconds of, uh, of runtime. Um, so yeah, there, there's something. Now, I mean, one of the differences that, that can impact this, um, the MediaTek board has less of a frequency range than the, the Chromebook 2 actually has a fairly wide, uh, you know, it goes from, as I say, 200 megahertz to 1800 megahertz, um, whereas the MediaTek board, it only has a gigahertz of, uh, of frequency range. So your values, if you look at the difference of what it's like to run at the power save governor versus the perf governor, um, you know, a smaller range, uh, you're going to have these sort of wild, uh, wilder fluctuations. It, just, it changes the responsiveness and the, you know, this uh, equation to uh, define which defines overhead is going to respond differently on a platform that has a smaller uh, range. So, uh, yeah. And then, Sorry, you know, uh, on which on which CPU have you run your test? This is CPU zero, okay. which yeah. Uh, which is an A53 actually on the EVB. We probably, yeah, we actually should have a theme that. Well, I'm assuming it's Freedom. Do you remember, was it CPU zero that this was wor work uh, run on? Uh, the, the workload was a fiend to CPU zero. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. So. So yeah, we could also try running it on CPU two, but I, I mean, regardless, it, it needs to be uh, investigated. Um, we also, so Freedom also collected power numbers for this, um, but I mean, you know, based on these regressions, uh, yeah, I mean, it shows a, an average power decrease, but that's, uh, you know, not that interesting when you're, you know, hurting for performance in so many, so many test cases, so th those numbers aren't really that useful. Uh, so yeah, the upstream surprise. Um, so this has been going on for like a year. You know, we've been, I, I don't know exactly how long the SCED uh, Freak project has been going on. I mean, I, but uh, certainly uh, on the order of a year. Um, and uh, Raphael Waisaki, the CPU Freak uh, maintainer, the, the PM maintainer, um, has been mostly silent until a month ago when he submitted his own version of this. <laughs> And yeah, we were, we were kind of taken aback by that. Uh, we would have certainly liked if he had uh, been more collaborative from the start, but uh, I, you know, it is what it is. So um, he posted the uh, first uh, set of CPU free cooks. Uh, I mean, in his defense, I think you know, it started out as uh, the goal was to get rid of the timers for the existing sampling-based governors. Um, and this, you know, he, he thought a good way to do this would be to just provide some callbacks from the scheduler that were periodic enough to be able to get rid of the, the timers. Um, but then that very quickly grew into, you know, the, the full-on, uh, you know, utilization-based uh, governor thing. So, uh, you know, initially when he just posted the, posted the hooks, I thought that that would be it, and okay, you know, we need to work uh, with that. But, uh, but then he also dropped uh, the second bomb, which was uh, his own implementation of this. So, um, actually, do I have the... Okay, so some important di uh, differences there of, of what he posted with our work. Um, his frequency algorithm, I mean, he basically just took the on-demand algorithm and, um, and used the same thing. So there are some issues with that, uh, in particular with frequency invariance. Um, you can get stuck with it, and there's weird semantics with respect to uh, the headroom. So the, the amount of headroom that you get on top of the demand of the tasks is basically linked to the fmin value of the platform. So you don't get a consistent behavior. Uh, you know, uh, across different platforms. You don't get a consistent amount of, uh, you know, of headroom for your demand across various platforms as the fmin value differs. Um, the way that he did the, the capacity hooks, um, there's no aggregation between RTDL and CFS. There's just a single utilization value going into the scheduler, um, and when the hook is called from wherever in the scheduler, that's going to overwrite, you know, whatever was previously written. Um, and as I say, he's using fmax for the RT and the DL classes. Um, and then also he doesn't, he's using a work queue um, rather than a k-thread, which, uh, you know, based on the interactive governor, there, I think there's, you know, Google, I think, had issues with uh, the frequency thread uh, not being high enough priority. Um, 
and I think there's a good argument to be made for that. Um, you know, when you're underserving the, the task demand, uh, I think the highest priority thing that you really have, ex you know, aside from maybe thermal, uh, is making sure that you can increase the capacity of the system, assuming you can do so. Um, and so, you know, the interactive governor, if you look at it, it uses an RT task, and so that's what we had done in Skedfreak, um, and I think that's what we should do when we converge these two solutions. So what does it mean? I mean, where is this going to go? So I, initially, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of under the impression that we were just going to get, you know, Raphael's solution was going to get merged in, and we were going to be faced with just taking pieces of what we had done uh, and trying to, to get it in sort of after the fact. Um, that, that looks like it's, it, it's starting to turn into more of a deliberation, and there's, uh, there's more of a conversation going on, so I think we can uh, maybe impact uh, what will be initially merged. But even if that's not true, yeah, we can, we can still. Skedfreak still has value getting to the second point. Um, the value of, of our work is that we at least have sort of a roadmap or a picture of what we'd like to see in ARM, right? We have something that we've started playing with, um, a rough idea of how we think it should be structured. Um, and then we also, it was nice to see um, Ingo weighed in, um, what is this, a week ago or something, uh, with some nice words about uh, how actually our solution, so Ingo had been quiet during all this debate um, and then finally weighed in sort of supporting the uh, design that we had, had come up with. Um, and I, I do want to point out that this work is mostly Mike Turquette's and, and Yuri's, um, even though we said it was my series because I posted it, but it's mostly their stuff. So. so what are the next steps? Um, th I mean, there, there's a, obviously a lot of work to still be done. So th you know, there's a lot of deliberation going on on, the, on uh, LKML. Um, I'd certainly encourage anyone uh, to, uh, you know, who's interested in this to participate in that discussion. It's, it's open for everyone, obviously, um, and run tests on your platform. Um, I, I think it is likely that we are going to have to, I mean, Raphael is the gatekeeper here, or, or, or certainly the, the most, uh, outspoken one. Um, and so he's the one that we really are going to need to sell our ideas on um, as far as the differences between what we have and, and what he was going to put in. So, uh, but we're making progress actually on that front already. Um, he's come around on the frequency algorithm. He's already moved away from this on-demand thing. I, th I think we've uh, convinced him of that. Um, the scheduler hooks, uh, that, that's going to be more work. Um, you know, Peter Z is not too happy about the invasive nature. You know, we, we've got a number of different hooks, as I mentioned. Um, Raphael's solution, as I say, he, he just put, uh, basically just, he's got one in the fair class, and then he's got a couple, and then I, uh, one, I think it's just one in the RT class. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're, they're less sophisticated, and I don't know that they're going to meet our needs. Uh, so that's going to be more of an effort. Um, and, and as I say, also uh, getting better response with those tasks, not doing this crazy, you know, ramp to fmax thing every time one of those tasks run, uh, runs. Um, those numbers, obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're really at a very early stage with, with doing uh, analysis uh, on, on real targets. Uh, we don't have any uh, results with real world use cases like, uh, you know, like UI flings or benchmarks or games. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to merge this with EAS. Um, you know, we, we really haven't done anything in terms of, you know, what happens when the, when the energy aware scheduler is, is placing tasks and wants to preemptively, uh, you know, what does this mean for the energy model? I mean, uh, you know, we, we've come up with our own little algorithm for here for, for measuring demand and, uh, and updating the frequency, but um, it, right now it's not, I don't think it's meeting uh, Ingo's uh, vision of, of really unifying these two things. Um, and that's going to be a hard problem to solve. Uh, just for on the yes yes thing basically uh, there has been basically a release of this thing as part of the yes patch set uh, a year ago uh, more or less in August so well I mean from my point of view uh, it's true there are still uh, things that has to be uh, done better but at least let's say that uh, these new um, way of having a CP for governor that basically it's controlled by the shadow it's closer to the uh, current solution where the governor itself is taking decision so let's say that I mean to me we are heading to the direction that Ingo was uh, was asking for yeah, uh, well so I, I guess my concern would be for example we we have this uh, headroom policy um, when EAS makes a decision to place tasks uh, you know distribute tasks in a certain way it's doing so with the intent of, of, say, minimizing power, right, without sacrificing too much performance, obviously. But is it, is, is it taking into account the fact that we're adding 
uh, bandwidth? So this 20% actually that, w that we uh, inserted in this uh, shared circuit thing actually came from ES. ES uses this uh, margin uh, to, to be able to switch from ES mode and the uh, non-ES mode. So okay. basically it takes into account this 20% thing. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, all the, uh, let's say, issues are fixed, but uh, uh, they are being, let's say, considered, I mean, in the, uh, in the design. When you say it takes an attempt to, to switch between the two modes, um, I mean, when you're more than 80% loaded, I understand, so that this is when you go into just normal mode and you switch off EAS, is that right? So, but, you know, if, if you're, say, you have a 20% load on a CPU, uh, and EAS is trying to determine how to distribute that. Is it taking into account the fact that we're going to run those CPUs higher than at 20% OPP? Oh, right. I mean, this is the, for, uh, it's one example of the things that has to be improved. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess, so yeah, yeah. perhaps it's an overstatement that we haven't looked at it at all. <laughs> I guess, I, yeah. I'm That's something we, we discussed during the last Connect, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's something that has to be solved in the second step. But uh, I think that it's going to the right direction, right? At least if we only have that to solve at the end, it should be quite, quite good for us. And then uh, there's a lot of, there's really not been any work yet on integrating this with Skedtune. Um, no testing that I've been involved with yet. Um, and then another big piece that uh, there's not been much activity on is window-based load tracking. So that's an alternate uh, load tracking scheme to perennity load tracking, uh, which is more similar to you know, what you get with uh, on-demand and interactive. Uh, the goal of it is to solve uh, some of the latency issues that Pelt has. Um, I'm actually going to be presenting some slides from Qualcomm on this uh, tomorrow. Uh, so if you want to learn more about window-based load tracking, you can attend that. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's not clear yet whether we can take some smaller steps with perennial load tracking uh, to, to get it to an acceptable point or whether we'll have to do something more radical, like find a way to uh, have an option for uh, an alternate load tracking scheme like window-based. So. And that's it. So are there any uh, last questions for folks? So as I say, there's a hacking session on this tomorrow. Um, and uh, if you've got any uh, deeper questions, uh, you're welcome to stop by. So yeah. Thanks. Thank you.